My name is Juliana. Um, I am speaking to you from Portugal and um, I give you good, good afternoon to those of you speaking from Hong Kong and other places in China. And good morning to Satish, who's connecting from the UK. And we actually, we have, I mean, slowly people join in, uh, but si having signed up for this talk, we have people from, I mean, beyond Hong Kong and the rest of China, we have more than 30 places still. Um, I mean, Taiwan, Japan, Philippines, Myanmar, Malaysia, India, Thailand, UK, Ireland, France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Sweden, US, Canada, Mexico, Barbados, Brazil, Colombia, New Zealand, Australia, Honolulu, Iceland, Cameroon, Kenya, and maybe more that have uh, joined us since yesterday. So I want to welcome very much all of you um, who took the time especially to be here on a Saturday to spend uh, time learning, connecting, and being inspired. As I said, my name is Juliana. I am Brazilian. I live in Portugal, and I have the pleasure of working with Kaduri Farm and Botanic Garden since uh, 2020. Some of you who have been in previous talks, uh, in previ the previous talks of our series may have seen my, my face here before. I work closely with the Kaduri F program which is an initiative that offers uh, create spaces and experiences to help reconnect us with ourselves, with each other and the rest of nature. As we understand, this is a, one of the most important educations that we need at our times. And this combines local and international uh, partners, teachers, speakers. So last October, we had the pleasure, for example, having Satish uh, for an in-person retreat in Hong Kong. Now we have him, today we have him um, in the screen for an online, uh, to learn with him online. And we have also different programs, uh, some online, some on-site, some that combine online and on-site. And this particular talk, in fact, besides being, being part of our uh, 2024 talk series, is also part of a three-week blended program um, that is running for the first time that is called Soil, Seed, and Community. And it combines online sessions with both uh, Satish and Vandana, which the participants have had um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, with also on-site experiential activities. So um, today, this group is together, and you may see them in the screen in the in the video, but they are together at KFBG where they have uh, spent the day learning with each other, cooking, and I think they just shared uh, a meal just before they are now joining us in the Zoom. So we'll have a group that is together at KFBG. So we are very grateful to, for the participants who enrolled in this program um, that is running for the first time and for all of you that are joining us for this session as we get this valuable chance to learn from Satish, one of the world's most important leaders today for speaking for nature, for the environmental movement. So we are said to um, report that Dr. Vandana was not feeling very well today. So she has been unable to join us, but she may join throughout the, the session, um, depends on, on how um, she was feeling. So we'll see if she joins, but we are very um, also uh, in the great hands of um, Satish, who um, you will know he is a returning teacher, has been with us in this online space for a few times. And uh, also, as I said, in person at KFBG, um, you will know that he uh, founded Schumacher College in the UK, that he also has been um, editor of Resurgent magazine for more than 40 years, that he's a pilgrim of the earth, having walked 8,000 miles uh, from India to Washington, 
Um, I mean, there's so many things that I imagine, you know, writer of many books, uh, Radical Love, uh, translated in uh, Chinese, Elegant Simplicity, Soil Soul Society, and more recently also has gained um, a film called Radical Love that shares uh, his legacy and um, his life and his, his teachings. So before passing to Satish, I will just make some uh, brief practical announcements for the smooth running of our space for the next hour and a half. So as I said, it's lovely for those of you who can't put the camera on. Um, we always appreciate seeing the, the different faces who are joining, um, not just the, the name and the screen. And after, the, um, after Satish's talk, um, we'll invite you to share your questions in the chat. Uh, Satish loves to, to receive questions and I would invite you to make notes of your questions throughout the talk. And then you can have them ready when the Q&A opens, you can type it in the chat. Uh, we will also be taking questions from those who are together at KFBG for the closing of this, their program. And, and please be reminded that this talk uh, is being recorded. It will be shared later with our wider um, KFBG audiences to help to spread this inspiration. You will also have access to the recording. Um, if you need any technical support during the talk, you may send a direct chat message to KFBG host and we will help you. And um, lastly, as you have seen in the chat as well, uh, there is on our talks, there are always the uh, simultaneous translation option to Pontonhoa and Cantonese. Um, you can, the default, as default, we are in the English channel. But if you wish to change, you can click interpretation button in the control bar at the, at the bottom, and you can choose Chinese or Cantonese. If you only want to listen to the interpreter's voice, you can mute the original audio under the same interpretation uh, button. Okay, thank you for your patience with all these practicalities. And I will now pass to our dear Satish. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, on my screen, I can't see um, either myself or you. I see this um, white, white something. So, but if you have some technical person who can remove this white, so I can see, um, a, 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 if possible, a, a kind of gallery, so I can see the pictures of the people on the screen rather than this white something. So, see if you can do something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you can hear me, so that's good, and I can hear you. That's good. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Juliana uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, program about soil and seed and the soil as a source of life and seed as a life itself. It's a wonderful, wonderful subject. But before I start to talk about soil and seed, I would like to invite you to a short meditation on gratitude to soil and gratitude to seed and gratitude to life. So bring your right hand in front of you and see the world in your right hand. Then bring left hand in front of you and see the yourself, see the self in your left hand. And then bring two hands together and see the world and the self united. We are all interdependent. We are all interconnected. We are all interbeings. With that unity of life in our consciousness, breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Let go of any expectations. Let go of any worries. Let go of any anxiety. Let go of any fear. Breathe in. Breathe out. Smile. Relax. And let go. And feel a deep sense of gratitude to four elements. Earth. Air. 
fire and water. These four elements make life and sustain life. All life is sustained by these four elements. So thank you, earth. Thank you, air. Thank you, fire. Thank you, water, for sustaining life. With that gratitude to four elements, breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Breathe in again, breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Then feel a deep sense of gratitude to the invisible elements, consciousness, spirit, soul, imagination. These invisible elements make life. Without them, earth, air, fire, water have no life. So, with deep gratitude to consciousness, to spirit, to soul, to imagination, breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Then, we feel a deep sense of gratitude to our ancestors from whom we have received so many wonderful gifts. Art, culture, music, poetry, language, philosophy, architecture, and much more. Thank you to all our ancestors. With a deep gratitude to our ancestors, breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Let go of any sense of separation and feel a deep sense of gratitude and unity of life. Breathe in, Breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Then we feel a deep sense of gratitude to our own body and ourselves. This body is the temple for our spirit, for our soul, for our consciousness, for our imagination, for our compassion. Thank you to our bodies and ourselves with a deep love and gratitude for ourselves. Breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Then bring the future generations in our consciousness and may we leave a beautiful planet uncontaminated unpolluted beautiful gifts for our future generations and may the future generations celebrate life and have a good life and enjoy life as we have done so the future generations in our consciousness and in our minds and in our hearts breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax and let go. Then feel the whole cosmos is our country. Whole planet Earth is our home. The whole of humanity is our family. 
nature is our nationality and love is our religion and yet we are rooted in our community and the place to which we belong. This way we combine the intimate with the ultimate, community with the cosmos, local with the global, individual with the universal, with that unity of life in our hearts. Breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax, and let go. Thank you. Okay, so let us start with soil. Soil is the source of life. The word for soil in Latin is humus. And humus means soil. And therefore the word human is related to humus. So human beings are literally soil beings. We are made of soil. Our bodies our soil transformed into skin and bones and all the other parts of our bodies. The food we eat is soil transformed. All the wonderful food like fruit, mangoes and papayas and oranges and bananas and all that comes from the soil. We forget it. When we are eating delicious food, we have to have a deep gratitude to the soil. Without the soil, there are no trees. Without the soil, there's no food. The clothes we wear, the cotton, the wool, they all come from the soil. Without soil, there are no clothes. The houses we live in, built with wood or bricks or stone, they're all soil transformed. So soil is the truly source of life. Without soil, there's no life. But nowadays, <coughs> humanity just takes soil for granted. And even many people in the world think the soil is lifeless. And therefore we put lots of chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides to bring life into the soil. This is a completely mistaken view. Soil is the source of life. Soil is a living soil. We have to revere the soil. And as soil feeds us, we have to feed the soil. Because life has to be fed. And therefore, it's a kind of cyclical economy that we create. So by what we take from the soil, we give back to the soil to feed the soil. All great good gardeners make compost. Compost is to feed the soil. Whatever comes from our food, that food has something for the compost. Like you eat bananas. The banana skin is protecting the banana. And then that skin you put back in the compost and become soil again. All food is like that. Orange peels, mango peels, ca cauliflower has leaves outside. They go back into the soil. And so if we can be mindful that whatever comes from the soil should go back to the soil. The, the economy of the soil is a cyclical economy. I mean, human industrial economy is a linear economy. So we take from nature, mining, oil, coal, anything else, 
we use it and we throw it away. And therefore we create so much pollution. Carbon emission creates global warming. Plastic in the ocean creates so much pollution. Sewage in our rivers. Everything has to go back to the soil and feed the soil and become soil again. Then it's a true economy of nature. True economy of soil. <laughs> and so we humans have to be humble and learn from soil. Soil is our teacher. Soil is our mentor. The book of soil. We have to learn to read the book of soil. Soil is source of life. So we forget that. All our minds are now engaged with new technology and new industrial products. And we want to focus on computers and cars and cameras and, and uh, internet and, and online um, uh, uh, communication. So much attention of the world is now put on technology. And the technology is actually causing many of our problems that we have today. Because technology is a linear. We make something and we make a technology and then technology cannot be reabsorbed into the soil. And therefore it creates mountains of waste, landfills. And as I said, oceans and rivers are polluted with a lot of our uh, waste. And therefore the first lesson for humanity is to come back to soil, get in touch with soil, remember the soil is a source of life and therefore taking care of soil, the living soil, taking care of the soil. Yeah. There was a wonderful English woman called Lady Eve Balfour. And she wrote a wonderful book called The Living Soil. If you have not read that book, I can recommend that book, The Living Soil by Lady Eve Balfour. She was the founder of the Soil Association. And there are thousands of members of the Soil Association in Britain and who maintain the soil, who make the compost and whatever comes from the soil, use it and return it back to soil. In nature and soil science and soil world, there's no pollution and there's no waste. If we take care of the soil, and use whatever comes from the soil and give back the soil, there's no pollution, there's no waste. Everything is a food for life. But we somehow see soil or nature altogether as separate. That's our first fundamental mistake of the modern industrial thinking. The soil and humans are separate. Although we are human beings, which means soil beings, and yet we have lost the meaning of the world. And we think that we are, we are not soil, we are separate from soil, we are separate from nature. So I would like in this talk to remind you that please remember that we are not separate from soil. We are soil. Everything is made of soil. Soil is a source of life and therefore there's no separation. There's no disconnection. We are soil. We are nature. When we think of nature, we think of mountains, forests, animals, birds, oceans, rivers, but never of humans. We think humans are not nature. Humans are somehow separate. <clears throat> so if we can correct this mistake and remember that we are nature, we are soil, we are earth, air, fire, water. Because all these four elements make everything. Human body is made of four elements. So is animal body or forest body or mountain body or any body. So everything is made of these four elements and therefore we are all nature. The second mistake we say that not only that we are separate from nature and we are separate from soil, but we are above nature. Soil is only a source of food. 
Soil is only a source of economy. Soil is producing a commodity. Like, like grain, rice, wheat, barley, corn, all these are commodities. So many farmers are growing commodities, not food, but commodities to buy and sell. So soil has become a source of making profit. Not soil has, is a source of food and source of life, but a source of making profit, source of economy. That needs to change. We need to say that we are not only, we are nature and we are soil, but soil is life itself, source of life itself. This is what we need to understand. Unless we, we bring the revere soil, almost it's a kind of religious, religious experience. We have to revere soil, have a kind of deep respect for soil and deep respect for nature. And so this way we can become one and, and we see soil as source of life and not source of economy. At the moment, we are thinking that soil is a source of economy, source of making profit, source of making money. And I want that today in your mind to change that it's not the source of economy, it's a source of life itself. That is first and fundamental. So we are not separate from nature and we are not above nature. We are nature and nature and soil has intrinsic value. We must not value natural resources. We call them resources. Which they all, all the, source is different from resource. Remember the two words have a different meaning. So it's a source of life, not a resource for the economy. <laughs> That's a big, big, big change, big difference we have to remember. And so this is a kind of a deep ecology point of view. There was a, a wonderful philosopher in Norway called Arne Ness. He was at our teacher at Schumacher College. And he coined this term deep ecology. That means that the value of soil or value of nature altogether, but today we are talking about soil, so let me put soil on the, uh, on the, uh, on the forefront. The value of soil and value of nature should not be measured in terms of soil's usefulness and nature's usefulness to humans. Soil and nature has intrinsic value, <coughs> irrespective of their usefulness to humans. Trees are good, not because they give us oxygen or take our carbon or give us fruit, or give us shade, or give us wood. All those are secondary. Primary, the nature, the trees are good in themselves. They are good not because they are useful to me, but they are good because they are trees. Animals are good as animals. Humans are good as humans. All life has intrinsic value. This is a deep ecology perspective. And I would like to, you to move from ecology to deep ecology. Deep ecology is to say that nature and humans are one and that deep experience of nature by being in nature, learning from nature and seeing nature ha having intrinsic value. So that's a, my kind of uh, urge to you is to learn about deep ecology and, and understand uh, the intrinsic value of nature and soil and all life. Now, let's move a little bit from soil to seed. So from my point of view, seed is a kind of essence which gives life itself. So an acorn has the oak tree in it. What a kind of the economy of nature is that in acorn, you have the whole tree. And then that acorn is in relationship with soil. And when you put acorn in the soil, soil gives its body, and with the help of the sun, 
and the help of water, and the help of air, these four elements, that seed, that seed becomes a plant, a tree, and a branches, and acorns again. And not from that one acorn, now you are getting thousand acorns. What abundance, what abundance. One seed is producing thousands of seeds. Take a mangoes. You eat beautiful, delicious mango. I call it mango nomi. Economy is a mango nomi. Now, mango you are eating. So you have a delicious, fragrant, juicy fruit, which will give you nourishment, will give you vitamins and minerals. And, and protein and all those things come from fruit or food. And so you eat mango, but in the mango, there's a seed. And that mango seed you put back in the soil. And that one seed, just one single seed becomes a tree. And that tree will produce thousand mangoes. Unfortunately, Vandana Shiva is not today with us uh, because her health is not... Uh, in good order, but Vandana Shiva's farm in India, in Dehradun, north of India, in her farm she had 500 mango trees. The true example of mango nomi. And those 500 mango trees may have come from one seed. Because one seed become a tree and give you thousand mangoes, and those thousand mangoes have each seed again. What a miracle of nature. And that, if I say to industrialists, people who make cars and computers and, and all the kind of technology, say, can you produce one product in your industry which is as good as a mango? Mango gives you food, nourishment, nutrition, and has no waste and no carbon emission, no pollution, no plastic. And each mango is covered, wrapped with a skin. Very soft skin. And you take the skin away and put it on the compost. And the skin will become the soil. And you eat the, 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 uh, the flesh of the mango and, and the seed, you go back into the soil. What a wonderful economy. I call it mango nomi. Mango nomi is the most... Can you produce one product in an industrial system which is as good as mango and has no pollution, no carbon emission, no, uh, no waste? That is a miracle of seed. I would say <clears throat> that to learn the magic, the miracle of the seed, Every school in the world should have a garden. Every school, wherever you are, you are in China or India or America or Australia or New Zealand or Europe or Africa or South America, wherever you are, every school, because every place you have a seeds and every place you have a nature and every place you have a soil. But our children don't learn about the soil. Children don't learn about the seed. They learn about history, geography, uh, mathematics, science, computers, uh, smartphones, how technology works, everything we are teaching. But we are not teaching much or, or anything if, uh, sometimes uh, about nature, about soil, about seed. So if every school has a garden and every child, maybe you learn Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, history, geography, uh, science, technology, mathematics, etc. But... Thursday and Friday, go in the garden and water the plants and, and sow the seed of a tomato. What a miracle. That Can you imagine the tiniest of the tiny seed is the tomato seed. And that one tomato seed you plant, which is so small, almost kind of, you have to have a magnifying glass to see it. So small, like a mustard seed, tomato seed. Now that you plant that one tomato seed and that one comes into a plant 
and then it has got a blossom, and then have got a something fruit, and a yellow tomatoes, and a, 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 a green tomatoes, yellow tomatoes, red tomatoes, juicy tomatoes, and from that one tiny seed, you get 50 tomatoes. Children need to learn. Children need to see the miracle, the magic, the amazing uh, transformation, the abundance, the abundance of uh, seed and the soil, and how seed and soil in relationship create this magic and this abundance of wealth. People think wealth. What is wealth? People think of wealth, but they don't really know what is wealth. They think wealth is money. But money is not wealth. Money is only a measure of wealth. The real wealth is soil. The real wealth is seed. The real wealth is trees. The real wealth is human skill. Knowledge of planting the seed and looking after the seed and looking after the plants and looking after the trees and looking after our food and fields and so on and animals. That skill, that dedication, that love, that is the real wealth. So we have forgotten that the skillfulness is the real wealth. We don't, nowadays we have low, these skills. If you have a graduate, from big university, like in England, we have Oxford, Cambridge. In America, you have Harvard, Yale, big, big universities. University of Beijing, University of Hong Kong. Wherever you are, you come out of the university and you don't know anything about life. Quite often, people don't know much about soil. Although they are graduates from universities, they have big degrees, PhD, MA, BA, whatever degree you have, um, more than one degree sometimes multiple degrees, but you don't know anything about soil, you don't know anything about seed, you don't know how to build a house, you don't know how to plant uh, um, uh, potatoes, you don't know how to, uh, to, uh, to make compost, you don't know anything about life. Our education is so limited that we spend millions and billions and billions of dollars and pounds and euros and whatever money you have in your country, just educating the half head, the left hemisphere of the brain, which is the brain of logic and management and administration and science and, and measurement. And we forget that we have a right hemisphere of the brain. And that right hemisphere is totally ignored in our educational system. And we don't know how to, to feel, how to have intuition, how to sort of have a creativity, how to have a kind of relationship, how to have a kind of uh, imagination. All these things are not encouraged in our education. So I would like to see a real revolution in our educational system where every school has a garden, every university has a field. Our students should know how to grow food, how to build a house, how to use their hands. At Schumacher College, we say, we need to have educational head and both hemisphere of that brain, left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Education of a whole head, but also education of a heart, feeling, love, compassion, connection, relationship. Appreciation of trees and flowers and fruit and soil and animals and birds and butterflies. What a magical world we have. What a, what a beautiful, wonderful world we have. And we don't appreciate it. We are just stuck in our classroom, in front of a screen, in front of a blackboard. And we say, this is education. Education is not just on your blackboard. Education is not just on your computer screen. Education is life itself. Seed is the source of education. Soil is the so source of education. So I would say to our children in the schools and our young people in our universities to get out of your classroom. But go in nature and sit under a tree. Buddha was enlightened by sitting under a tree. And plant a seed in the soil. Build the soil. That is a real education. And then, of course, you can learn about computers and you can learn about science and logic and, and analysis and, and history and geography and mathematics. All that are fine. I have no problem with that. But they are all icing on the cake. All that intellectual knowledge is icing on the cake. The real cake is seed, the soil, nature, our relationship with the natural world and humanity.
This is what I would like to, to see. And therefore, I would say uh, thank you, KFBG, Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden. And if you have not had any opportunity to visit KF, KFBG, Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden, please visit it. I have been there many times. And that's a real example of soil and seed. It's one of the best botanical garden in the whole world. I've seen many botanical gardens in the world, but nothing like that. Very natural, very organic, very beautiful, very mysterious. So I, it had always been my great pleasure and joy to visit Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden. And I would like you, if you have an opportunity and chance to visit it, please visit it and see with your own eyes the, how we can look after soil how we can look after seed and abundance of life you can experience. At the moment, our economy is based on scarcity of everything. There's never enough of everything. But in nature, there's no scarcity. In soil and seed, there's no scarcity. You know, millet, a millet means million seeds. In one cob, you can get million seeds. That's a millet. That's a food for the future. So what we are doing today, this genetic engineering, is anti-seed. Kind of uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides and so on, it's anti-soil. We have to become pro-seed, pro-life, and pro-soil. That is the challenge of our time. And this is the work of Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden, which I celebrate and, and I support. And I think that we need all over the world many, many wonderful farms of that kind, so that we can look after our soil, we can look after our seed, and we can lo look after our life. And then on top of that, as icing on the cake, we can have technology and science and, and all the other things are fine. There's no problem. But without soil, without seed, there's no life. Please remember, without sea soil and without seed, there's no life. If you want to love life, you want to protect life, you want to celebrate life, then celebrate seed and celebrate soil. Protect seed and protect soil. Seed and soil are the, the life itself. And if you can protect them, then everything else will be looked after by itself. I mentioned Lady Eve Balfour. I visited her. And her garden was amazing. Wonderful garden. And I said to her, how do you get such a wonderful garden? And she said, I do nothing. I just look after the soil. And soil looks after everything else. What a wonderful philosophy she had. Just look after your soil, and soil will look after everything. Your food, your clothes, your housing. <laughs> everything will come from the soil. Look after your soil. Protect your soil. That's the conviction that I have. That's my passion that I have. My passion is soil and seed. And so I'm so delighted to have this opportunity and chance to speak to you about soil and seed. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, KFBG. And thank you all of you who have organized this earth program and the Kaduri Farm program. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be delighted to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Thank you very much for animating these two words. Um, soil and seed with so many colors and shapes and and uh, yeah beautiful images and a lot of strength also um so now we open the space for questions questions and answers and you can please type uh, your question if you prefer to type your question in Cantonese or Potunghua then we also have the team who can help to translate it in the chat so feel free to do that. Um, and I just one thing that um, struck me is this the two words, two words, seed and soil. So we so this program that this talk is part of that is called uh, Seed Soil and Community uh, was designed particularly to start with two things that are easy to find in a city setting. Uh, because it was designed also for people who live in Hong Kong. And I was wondering, just to start, Satish, if you have uh, a message to people who are living in um, very populated cities, living in a building um, with a lot of concrete around, 
what the ways to cultivate um, the yes the abundance that you describe through seed and soil. So maybe we can start there, and then we'll be taking the questions that come. Okay, okay. Yes, there are large numbers of people in the world today live in cities. Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, Mumbai, Tokyo, New, New Delhi, New York, etc., etc. So yes, I think we need to find a way of embracing soil and making soil and building soil in our cities. So I would say wherever the little empty space, use that empty space to create a garden. Because even in the city, there are lots of empty spaces. Then, of course, in the cities, we have roofs. And on the roof, you can put soil. I was in London once, and I was visiting a friend. And my friend offered me fresh mint tea. And I said, dear friend, generally I get a tea bag of mint tea, but you are offering me this fresh mint leaves, green leaves for tea. Where do you get this? In this London city. He said, do you want to see my garden in London city? So where is your garden? I said, come with me. We went upstairs. And on the roof, he had wonderful soil, a compost bin, and he makes beautiful soil, and he grows mint and sage and, and, and many other herbs, and he has beehives, and he makes honey, and he opened a, a, a cupboard and offered me a pot of honey. I said, I made this honey on this roof in London. So you can have herbs, and you can have uh, trees even, uh, you can have many things. So every roof in big cities must have a garden. G garden, roof garden, roof garden. So that's the one thing that every, if you're mindful, if you're aware, uh, if you have willpower <coughs> to bring nature in the city, nature and culture together, marriage, of nature and culture. There's no separation between uh, nature and culture. Cities can have nature as well. And so bring nature back into the city and make city green and all the roofs. Or you can have, of course, solar panels on the roof to have energy. So you reduce your dependence on fossil fuel and you reduce your dependence on uh, oil and, and, uh, and, uh, and have solar panels and have a, a vegetable gardens. Also, Juliana, the cities have lots of buildings and all buildings have lots of walls. You can have a garden on the walls. I was in Australia, in uh, Sydney once, and I visited a, a, a house which all the walls had a kind of water irrigation system and, and a vegetables and a fruit and the flowers and herbs growing on the walls. So um, roof garden, wall garden, and any empty space in the city, if you will, there's a way. First thing is you want to, want to have a garden in a city. So Hong Kong is, is no exception. Actually, Hong Kong is a very beautiful natural city. Uh, about 40 50 percent of Hong Kong is natural and there are lots of lots of the beautiful islands and Hong Kong is not just a central Hong Kong there are other other places in Hong Kong and they should be protected the city of Hong Kong should say that we have enough buildings enough roads enough airports enough those the concrete we don't have to be in love with concrete we can have nature and trees and a soil and a seed also in Hong Kong so nature and culture should be married together cities can have uh, cities can have soil and nature and seed in the cities there's no animosity between cities and seed cities and soil cities and seed can go together they can live together they should live together without seed and without soil cities will die 
Wonderful. And we, I will bring a question that is connected uh, and builds on that um, from uh, Lung, who says that uh, he, he's been working, been connecting community farms in Hong Kong uh, in a remote island and um, recruiting a number of young apprentices. And he was wondering if you have advice on how to connect more young people and children with nature given the current uh, education being so focused on classroom and not on authentic experience? Yes, I did say that every school should have a garden. That's a one way. But also, you have as class, intellectual academic classes on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Make Friday a day of nature. Outdoor classroom not in the school building, but take children out in the mountains, in the hills, in the forest, by the sea, in the river, in the in, uh, Kaduri farm, somewhere, so that children can experience nature. One day a week, minimum, minimum, one day a week, children should go out of the classroom. Children should go out of the school. And the teacher should say, Friday is a day of nature. Friday is a day of hiking, walking, gardening, um, uh, and, and learning from nature. Four days a week, you're a human teacher in your classroom. Fifth day, day, fifth day of the week, nature is your teacher. So outdoor classroom, go walking. At the moment we live in the world, and our children live in the world today, as if we have no legs. We don't walk, even for... At half a mile, we have to take a taxi or take a, a bus or take a car or our parents have to drive to the school. I think that children should learn to walk. Their health will be better. Their legs will be stronger. Their mind will be clearer if they walk in nature. And so one day a week, every school should take children out in hiking, in, um, in hills, in, in mountains, in the sea, wherever you can go, go out of the school. That's my advice. Great. So another aspect um, that so people are bringing different questions, and I am picking those that are bringing different aspects to the to the conversation. And uh, one is from Debbie and Pete, who are asking, "How do you suggest um, educating our local farmers to move away from chemical farming to regenerative farming?" I mean, uh, preaching is not enough. I mean, I am preaching a little bit, but preaching is not enough. You have to set some good examples. And so when you show these farmers who are using chemicals and fertilizers and, and all sorts of things which are undesirable, invite them to see an organic, a regenerative, sustainable farm. When you see, you believe. At the moment, farmers think, oh, I have to produce lots of food to sell, to make money. But if you show them that an organic farm can produce even more food per acre than industrial farm. Factory farming is not a, a source of producing large amount of food. If you take if you take intensive farming, the organic small scale farm, 50 acres, 100 acres farm, they produce more food than a 500 or 1000 acre farm, industrialized factory farm used with machines and, and chemicals and fertilizers. So th there's a clear example and clear evidence that small scale organic intensive farming produces more food. Only thing we have to do, and this is why I said that every school should have a garden and every university should have a farm. Only thing we have to do is to introduce uh, the agriculture and farming early in life so that children don't grow with the fear of farming. At the moment, our young people have fear. They think, oh, I can't grow food. I can't grow um, vegetables. I can't plant trees. These are too difficult. Our hands get dirty. The weather is too cold. All that fear 
is in our minds and in our hearts. So I think we, if we introduce the child, introduce the young people early in life, in a school and university, so that they grow mm -hmm. up without fear of nature. They grow up without mm -hmm. fear. That, oh, I don't know how to grow food. I don't know how to plant uh, uh, seeds. I don't know how to save seeds. They don't know it. And therefore they have fear. So only way to change uh, our farming practice and, and change the, the people who are using chemicals and fertilizers and all uh, kind of poisonous uh, uh, substances into the soil to show them the good example uh, of uh, organic farming. So set an example. This is why I say visit, bring the, the factory farmers and, and the big chemical farmers to Kaduri farm and the farms of that kind who are practicing and showing that you can grow good food, good amount of food by organic methods and, and permaculture methods. Wonderful. We have uh, a lot of questions and great questions coming. And I mean, there are two questions I'd like to select, but I think one, uh, in a way, um, Satish was addressing, you were addressing just now around speaking about uh, young people and you have to move away from fear because there is a question that is um, sharing about a project and then asking how can the, that saying that the students, uh, the young people, the students, the internal drive for life is not enough um, to really get engaged in the project. And I think in a way you were speaking um, about this when you were touching about moving away from, from fear. I don't know if you have, if you want to say more on that relating to young people and yes, you know, drive. fear of the unknown is the biggest fear. I mean, people think that driving an aeroplane is easy because they know they are trained to do it. Driving a tractor or car is easy. Driving a machine is easy, uh, but growing food is difficult. Uh, uh, saving seed is difficult because we don't know. What we don't know, we fear. And so this is why I put so much emphasis on education. When you know something, you don't fear. But when you don't know, you fear. So knowledge of seed, knowledge of soil, knowledge of planting, knowledge of looking after soil, looking, knowledge of looking after our forest and trees, that should start early in our life. At the moment, our education is deprived of that knowledge of seed and knowledge of soil and knowledge of community. We are grown and educated and, and, and conditioned to think as individuals, separate, and, and not connect with community, not connected with soil, not connected with nature. We are separate, we are, uh, uh, um, we are resourceless, and we have to find a job, somebody has to give us money, and everything has to come out of money. We have to buy a house, buy food, buy this, buy that. I can't grow, I can't build, I can't use my hands. So we have become de-skilled. And therefore, our education needs to be reskilling, bringing skills back, skills of life. Uh, and so when you can bring that, then fear will go. Fear is because we don't know, fear of the unknown. So, so if you can teach children from an early age how to cook, how to build, how to grow, how to garden, how to farm, how to make a, a cloth, how to repair, how to mend, using your hands, there will be no fear. So fear of the unknown. Give them knowledge. Great. Now we go for one um, a little bit more um, technical or practical. Um, that is uh, from um, Amigo uh, saying, if you agree on designated agricultural land policy for the benefit of agriculture, uh, should we encourage land trusts? He or she is asking. <laughs> yes, we should encourage land trust. First of all, we have to say that land does not belong to us. We belong to the land. We come and we go. We are born and we die. But the land will remain here more or less eternally. Land is eternal. And so we are not the owners of the land. 
we are the trustees of the land. From We have to shift our consciousness from ownership to relationship. We have a relationship with the land, like you have a relationship with your parents, with your friends, with your colleagues, with your children. You have a relationship with the trees, with the animals, with the soil, with the seed, with the land, with the earth. So moving away from ownership to relationship. And rather than thinking that I own the land and land belongs to me, we have to start to think that I belong to the land. Humans belong to the land. Land is eternal. Humans will come and go. And so that way, uh, we are trustees. We have a trust and we are trustees of the land. While we are alive, we look after the land. We make sure the land is maintained in a good health. Soil has a good health, healthy soil, healthy land, so that we have borrowed or we have inherited from our ancestors and we are borrowing for the future generations. And therefore, we should leave the land in good health and good condition for the future children, children future generations our children and great children and great 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 grandchildren so the land will be here for millions of years to come and we will come and go so there's no idea of ownership only relationship only trusteeship so we are trustees of the land we take care of the land but we don't own the land land is not a commodity commodity land is a community and we belong to this community of land if we can think in that way and we educate our children and then move from ownership to relationship and from ownership to trusteeship, then I think we can take care of the land much better. Great. So now we have one question that uh, bring, moves us a little closer to Vandana's work, but which I think you, uh, I'm sure you address is also part of your experience, but looking at this um, seed and the, this power dynamic between big, big companies and, and community projects. So someone who runs a, a platform in Singapore around seed exchange um, is asking, saying there seems to be this huge divide in how seeds are seen in many projects promoting community access, uh, being funded by governments and foundations. And at the same time, we have companies like Bayer who are making billion dollar valued seed monopolies. So how can community seed projects sustain themselves to build impact in the yes, space. That's, that's a big question. And, and Vandana Shiva has written a lot about it. But I think that uh, from it's a very big question. And I don't think there's any easy answer uh, because these buyers and Monsantos and, and governments are so big and so powerful uh, that uh, it is not always easy. Although we can, we, we have to challenge them. And we have to say that um, you, uh, we are not going to buy your um, buy your kind of Monsanto seeds or, or genetically engineered seeds or buyer seeds. We have to refuse non-cooperation. So we have to build a whole new movement of non-cooperation. Farmers have to say, we are not going to buy your seeds because the seeds you are buying from buyers it's an empty seed. It has no uh, regenerative, uh, regenerative power. You plant once and that's it. Then you have to go back to buyer. You have to go back to Monsanto and buy seed again for the next year. So you become dependent on big companies who are producing these um, genetically engineered uh, empty seed, what Vandana Shiva calls empty seed. So we have to say that Seed must be regenerative. Each seed you plant, then it will have another seed and that seed can be replanted. Then farmers will be free. Farmers will be independent. Farmers will not be in debt of big companies. Farmers will not need so much money to buy seed every year, year after year after year. So that independence of farmer, freedom for farmers to, is so valuable. At the moment, our big companies are destroying the freedom and the independence of farmers and making them dependent and making them dependent on money. And so, uh, so 
uh, the ag agriculture becomes a kind of monoculture and a kind of money culture rather than agriculture. And therefore, we have to non-cooperate, withdraw our cooperation, and we have to build a movement that no farmer should buy um, buyer seed or Monsanto seed or genetically engineered seed. Every farmer need to save their seeds for the next year. And that saving seed is the living seed and that uh, that cannot be replaced by genetically engineered seeds. So non-cooperation with the big companies and non-cooperation with big governments is the answer. And, and all farmers have to non-cooperate and remain independent and free. Yeah, so in a way, the next question that was coming from Xiao Ling, um, you just answered it because it was asking if you think uh, every farm is a seed bank. Um, and in a way, you just um, yeah addressed that. Yes, every farm is a seed bank. It should be a seed bank. Mm -hmm. and, and every farm should have a seed bank so that you are protecting the seed uh, for the next year. So when you have a crop, before you eat, you put the seed away. You don't eat the seed. So if you have a, a ton of wheat, put a few kilos of seed separate. Save it for next year. And then remaining, you can eat. So seed must be protected. And every farm must have a seed bank. On the on the side of those then who who eat or all of us, but in the side of um, eating then the food, we had a question from um, Yam Willy um, saying we are so afraid today in our food that we will eat something that was growing from contaminated soil. Um, how can we avoid this? Is eating organic? And then it, um, he or she puts in parentheses, which is expensive, uh, an answer to this problem. Yes, I mean, expensive is only a relative term and food should come first. Food is a priority. So before you spend your money on computers and cars and, and, and electricity and all the other luxury things that you buy and, and, and say, so you are saving money on food to spend money on something which is not so essential and so fundamental. So I would say that I will not compromise uh, the paying the true price, the, the just price for the food and buy good food, tasty, delicious, organic, healthy. And you don't need so much food if you eat good food. We eat too much food and, and create a lot of obesity. Eat less, but eat good food and be healthy. Body needs only small amount of food, remain slim and not, not, not get obese, and, 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 no, and the waste. 40% of food in England is wasted. 40%, Juliana, not just small amount. So if we avoid wasting food, and in our Zen monasteries in Japan, where I go sometimes, they, the chef, the cook in the Zen monastery says, not a single grain of rice should be wasted. Not a single grain of rice should be thrown away. So use your food frugally, without waste. Spend money on your food. Eat good, organic, healthy, delicious um, uh, food. And, and then the, whatever the money left behind, then use that money to buy computers or cars or, or, or cameras or, or any other technology. Food comes first. So if you are saying the food is expensive, your priorities are wrong. You have to give food your priority. And... and uh, and the, the, the organic food is just food, but also grow your own. If you can have a, a roof garden, you can have a walled garden, you can have a little, little somebody has a garden, you can go and say, can I help you? Can I volunteer you? Then you can share some food. Then food can be free. When you go to a garden, soil does not ask you, have you got a visa card? A mango tree does not ask you, have you got a visa card? Or have you got a wallet? Money is only a human invention, only in the shops. Nature provides food free, completely free for everybody. Only thing nature wants is plant the seed, plant the tree. If you plant a mango tree, that mango tree will give you thousands of fruit year after year for 50 years. 
So nature does not ask you money. It's only humans ask money. So I would say, uh, don't try to save money on food, but also grow your own. Have somebody who has a land or garden and grow there. If you have a willpower, you will find a way. If you want to do something, you will find a way to doing it. It's, you have to want it. You have to love the soil. You have to love the trees. You have to love the seed. And, and with that love, you will find your way. So there's no excuses. Excuse that organic food is too expensive, therefore I can't buy it, so I'll go to supermarket. That's a feeble excuse. Yes, I also uh, heard um, once someone who said you shouldn't, um, instead of thinking how organic food is expensive, you should think how the the normal normal food you buy, supermarket food, why it's so cheap. So it's also like realizing why uh, actually food we find in the supermarket has become um, so cheap. Uh, yeah. they, are they are cheap because they on. pay they pay farmers very poor price. So the farmers don't get good money. And then there's a lot of natural expenses. The environmental cost is very high. We are polluting our rivers, we are polluting our oceans, we are polluting our air, we are polluting our atmosphere. And that we don't take into account the amount of cost we are putting externally on nature and on mm -hmm. the environment. And therefore, our food is cheap because nature is paying the price. So instead of nature paying the price, we should pay the price and buy the food, which is the right kind of food, and not put, uh, not externalize the cost of our food. Yeah. So we are, um, we still have um, just a bit less than ten minutes, and um, we have three questions left. One of them, I think, actually, we might uh, refer to some of Vandana's books because it's uh, from uh, Shirley is asking about experiences of proper seed keeping, how to keep seeds long term, etc. And I'm thinking we uh, we may refer to um, Shirley to Vandana's books where there might be more detailed um, knowledge on seed saving. Yes. Also, you know, uh, Vandana and I are teaching a course in November, next month, from 18th of November to 22nd of November. If any of your audience is interested uh, to come and see uh, Bandana Shiva's seed bank and a farm and a 500 mango trees, and I will be there and Bandana will be there, so we can have in, uh, in person and, and a living course there. If people are really interested, uh, they are, uh, they are uh, welcome to come uh, to the course and uh, learn from Vandana and myself uh, and, and see the example, living example of a seed bank and, and how we save the seeds and how we look after the land and the soil. Wonderful. So we'll uh, share the link um, either later before the end of the talk or as also by email, we can share the link to people of the course. Thank you. Thank you. And, and then we... <laughs> We have one uh, question from Aulo, and then I will bring a final question uh, to close. So uh, Aulo is asking how to motivate farmers or growers to cooperate and contribute to the community. So, but I feel in a way, all that you've been sharing, you've been sharing so much with us um, and how I think if we can really bring this knowledge that you shared in this wisdom and spread also to people close to us, I think in a way there's a lot of answers there about how we can bring other people to cooperate. But if you have any additional um, advice or wisdom on how we can yeah, motivate farmers or growers to cooperate and contribute. That is a big community. question and they're yeah. always, that question is always there. But mm -hmm. I always say to people that please don't start with other farmers. Please don't worry about other farmers. Start with yourself. You be a great organic permaculture, seed saver, soil saver, and a gardener. Be the change that you want to see in the world. We always want government to change, Monsanto to change, buyer to change, our industry to change, somebody else to change. And we have no control over them. We can non-cooperate, we can protest, we can speak about it. But in the end, we have to be the example 
We have to be the change that we want to see in the world. We have to be the radiators of change. Be a radiator, if the cold radiator is not going to produce heat. A radiator has to radiate heat. Are you cold or are you hot? Are you a radiator? You have to ask that question. Am I a radiator? Always worrying about other people change. You have no control on other people, but you have control on yourself. Are you a gardener? Are you buying organic food? Are you saving seed? Are you protecting soil? If you are not doing it and you want somebody else to do it, it's not going to happen. Start with yourself. Everybody who is eating should be a gardener. Everybody who is eating food should be a seed saver. We are all eating, but we are expecting somebody else to produce our organic food. We want somebody else to do our permaculture, somebody else to do a, a cheap food. We don't want to participate. So be the radiator of change. Great. And I think just a final question to close. And that actually was the first question that was asked, um, but at, that uh, expands our topic here um, around uh, consciousness. So this is a question by Bobzi. And he's asking, what's the difference, if any, between consciousness, soul, and spirit? And I think it's quite uh, a journey then to, to have gone through with seed and soil and end um, talking about uh, the soul, consciousness, and spirit. So we'll have this to close. Okay. Thank you, Bob C. Um, it's nice to hear your question. And, and I'm glad that you are uh, listening to this uh, session. And, and I hope to see you again when I visit uh, Hong Kong next time. Your question is very wonderful and very big. Now, let's start the difference between soul and spirit. Spirit is first, uh, spirit is universal. And the soul is personal. So like I'm wearing this cotton jacket. This cotton jacket is made to fit my body. And it's personalized. But the cotton is universal. You, you might also be wearing a cotton shirt or cotton jacket. Juliana is also might be wearing cotton jacket. Cotton is universal, but every jacket is a personal. So the, so, so the soul is personalized. Each and every individual has that universal spirit made to measure for that particular person. So your soul and my soul has a more personalized, individualized, uh, intimate um, uh, entity, intimate identity. But when our body is removed, like this, this uh, cotton um, shirt or cotton jacket, it gets old, then it goes back in the compost and it becomes the soil again. And that's a spirit, universal. So universal coming into particular individual personalized. That's a soul. The spirit is universal and soul is personal, individual. That's the difference between soul and spirit. They are both connected. They're both part of the same big picture, but it's a bit more personalized and spirit is more universalized. So that's the difference. Now, consciousness is like being aware. Aware. That awareness goes beyond intellect. Awareness goes beyond academic knowledge. Awareness goes beyond language. Aware is more whole, more complete, more interrelated. When you speak about something, you can speak only one part of the truth. Or you can analyze something. Or knowledge is only part of the truth. But consciousness is a whole. Everything is in the consciousness. Consciousness is kind of primary. So uh, being conscious is beyond intellect beyond words, beyond language. You can be aware and conscious without Chinese or English or, or French or German or, or, or any other philosophy, um, uh, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism. All these are branches of knowledge. But the consciousness is a much bigger and a much more all-embracing and more all-inclusive uh, understanding, experience, which goes beyond uh, logic, beyond explanation. That's a consciousness. Consciousness is a very uh, sort of big picture. So that's a very big picture. I mean, this is a very short answer to your very 
important question. Uh, so I hope briefly what I have said makes some sense, but maybe we can, uh, when we meet together uh, next time I'm in Hong Kong, we can discuss it a bit more in detail. Thank you, Bobsy. Well, thank you, Satish, and everyone for joining along from seed and soil to, to soul. And so we are just about uh, closing. I'm going to just say a few things and then come back to you, Satish, for final words. But first, to thank you uh, very, very much for sharing always um, your fresh wisdom uh, with us. Um, it always comes alive in new ways and energizing ways. And I hope we all live with this uh, we leave this this zoom with the the sense of the connection with this abundance that you that you brought alive to us through your words of that we can meet through seed and soil and that we find ways every day to meet this in our lives and so thank you everyone for joining us for participating in the discussion for for asking the questions you've asked um, it's been lovely to see you on the screen, to see also groups together in the screen, to see children. So um, it's a wonderful way to start uh, our weekend. And we also send our best wishes for Vandana's health, for a speedy recovery. Um, we have just a few, then I have a few practical uh, announcements that one, we will share, you'll see in the screen, um, this poster called Radical Love. This is, like I mentioned at the start, this wonderful film that has been produced by a Brazilian uh, producer, uh, also a friend uh, called Julio and his team, who has produced, uh, they spent three years visiting Satish in his home, uh, spending time also at Navdanya, in, uh, at Vandana's place, when S Satish and Vandana were teaching together. And um, they made this uh, most beautiful film of Satish's legacy and his life that is to inspire uh, people. And we are going to have two opportunities in Hong Kong uh, between December and January for you to, to come and watch. So keep an eye, we'll still announce. Um, now you are in our mailing list, so you'll hear from us. And on your right, then you see the QR code where you can um, uh, get access to the questionnaire that will really help us if you can answer. Um, we know it's not the most um, yeah, fun thing to do, but it really helps us to keep these talks, keep this space, keep improving them uh, in ways that uh, serve all of us as a community of learners. And you will also receive the feedback on your email, also with a link to the recording of this talk that you can then share amongst your network, your friends, uh, your community of growers, uh, people you want to share this uh, wisdom with. So I think this is uh, yeah, it from our side. And so thank you again, everyone. And I will just pass Satish for your yeah, final words and... Well, thank you, Juliana. It was my pleasure to participate uh, and you wonderful host of this uh, uh, discussion and, and a good introduction and, and the Kaduri Farm and the educational program of the Kaduri Farm is wonderful and it's my great honor and pleasure to participate and be friend with Kaduri Farm. And I, the final message, if, if I may, is to create beauty, soil, and seed and soul all require beauty. Beauty before me, beauty behind me, beauty above me, beauty below me, beauty all around me. So let's create beautiful world. The, the nature is beautiful. Flowers and fruit and birds and rivers and mountains are beautiful. But we humans create so much ugliness so Hong Kong should be beautiful, not only industrial, not only managerial, not only financial, but also beautiful. So beauty is the, is the essence of seed. The beauty is the essence of so soil and the beauty is the essence of soul. So my final message to you is 
to go home or be at home and create beauty. Beautiful thoughts, beautiful words, beautiful actions, beautiful food, beautiful clothes, beautiful shoes, beautiful everything. Beauty is the answer to all our questions. And beauty will create love. And that's a radical love. Thank you again for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. And then just very briefly, you'll see on the chat, people can see also a link to the event you'll be joining in Taiwan uh, from the end of November to December. So please, if you have access and you can join, uh, if you're near, uh, check the link that a colleague has shared in the chat to be able to join Satish in Taiwan at the end of this year. Great. So thank you again, Satish. And thank you. let's Bye -bye. create beauty.